webinar titled Business Turnaround Strategies for Success. Thank you again so much for joining. We're so happy to have you. My name is Sophia Vinder, and I will be the host of this webinar. And um, just so you know, we will be having a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to send them over to us through the Q&A function. I think it's at the bottom right hand side of your screen and we'll be sure to get to your questions at the end. Um, I think we can go on to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. Um, so our team consists of myself, Sophia, I'm a yeah. marketing associate at NMS. We also have Lilia, who is another marketing Hello. associate. Lilia, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I thought you made a sound. So Lilia is also there. And um, she's going to be hosting our next webinar in November. And I also want to take the time to thank you so much for setting this up for us, Lilia. I know you put a lot of effort into the back end of Zoom and Eventbrite. So it looks like it's working great. So thank you so much for that. Then, of course, last but not least, we have Harry Moore, Senior Partner and Head of Europe at NMS. He will be leading this webinar today, of course. But just before he begins, let me give you a little bit more information about who we are and what we do. Okay, so NMS is a global management consulting firm with a focus on business transformation and strategic growth. And unlike other consulting firms, we provide the expertise of big firm consultants without the high costs. So we have offices open now in Berlin, Frankfurt, London, as well as Paris. And our focus in Europe is on strategy as well as transformation specifically for the SME market. So this includes a broad spectrum of strategic operational and technology services, which include, of course, business turnaround, change management, digital transformation, interim support, and quite a few others. Um, I think that's enough about us, though. I think I'll, without further ado, pass over the mic to Harry. Thank you, Sophia. And thank you, Lydia, for setting things up. <clears throat> it's great to be here. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, I'd like to talk about operational turnaround based on my, my own experiences. Um, in my view, this differs from financial recovery or financial reconstruction, as it is often called, where new money is injected into the business, quite often through an insolvency process, or the business is sold. Um, the agenda this morning I'd like to go through is, first of all, define um, business turnaround as I see it, um, and then talk about some of the reasons for businesses going into decline, some examples, um, look at the main requirements for a successful turnaround, and then I'd like to go through the, the NMS five-point uh, recovery plan, turnaround plan. And throughout, I'll be referring to uh, one or two uh, case studies. Um, so look at a business turnaround. So for the purpose of this morning, I am defining business turnaround to be where if no remedial actions were taken, the company's performance would deteriorate to such a point that recovery would be impossible. So the underlying message is that the sooner we start to make the changes, the better the chances of survival will be. Look at some of the reasons for a business decline, and these are just some examples. We all know that most companies face a crisis at some point in their, their life, and managing any business has its risks and can be a continual battle. Imagine the scenario. You've lost sales, you've let some staff go, you're under pressure from the bank, or likely to be so, cash is very, very tight, you may have invested personally, it may be a family business. You need to find new customers and the future is uncertain. So looking at the various examples, um, gradual decline to me is the most typical and is caused by a number of factors, including changes in the marketplace, um, lack of demand for the company's products, or the products themselves becoming outdated. Sometimes there's a lack of change and sometimes we see complacency in the, the, the management team. Sudden decline, and this is typical in today's uh, COVID climate, but otherwise it could be caused by a bad debt. It could be that customers have simply gone elsewhere. Um, it may be changes in legislation. It could even be the loss of a key member of staff, which is something that is quite common in, in a family business. Overtrading 
is where a company is growing very, very quickly, but does not have the working capital to support that growth and can soon run out of cash if it's not being paid quickly enough or if lead times are particularly long. It can typically affect entrepreneurial companies in very high growth sectors um, who will often take on more debt to support growth or use sometimes using voice discounting. Mediocre performance, sometimes referred to as zombie companies, is where the company just about manages to survive month to month, make some profits one month or loss the next month. Um, it's always struggling for cash, um, but is reluctant to change and eventually it does run out of cash. So I don't like to talk about the life cycle of a business. Um, my personal view is that most companies do go through a typical lifestyle and each requires a different management style. We start off with growth where we, we have the entrepreneur. So we have an entrepreneurial style of management. Somebody is leading the business who likes to build, likes to grow. The sort of person who cooks an excellent meal in the kitchen but doesn't like doing the washing up. Um, they'll leave a wake behind them. We reach a point where the company has grown and then we need to think about consolidation and we need a more structured approach and typically the entrepreneur will take on somebody to fulfill that role rather than do it themselves and that might be the financial director for example we then come to a point where there is a, a crisis in the business there's a problem and we need a different skill set we need somebody who likes change and typically turn around directors managers like change they thrive on change they're not particularly good at staying there for the long term and in my view probably they're at their peak in the first term the first six months of an assignment so different skill sets for different stages in the business's life talking about financial recovery or financial um, um, reconstruction on its own i believe it does not work um, it can be seen as a quick fix just putting money into a business on its own will not particularly save the business. If nothing has changed, all that happens is the company ends up back in resuscitation. If we put a company back on the shelf and the shelf is unsafe, then it will fall down. I'd now like to talk about the NMS five point turnaround plan. This is something that I developed over a number of years through the UK business recovery scheme, which I designed and managed on behalf of the UK government and was funded by them. It gives the turnaround some structure. It's not the definitive answer. It is an approach. It's an approach that, that we have used and used um, very effectively. But remember, in any turnaround situation, you also have to be creative as businesses are fluid, dynamic things and things change and evolve. And every situation and every environment is different. There is no one size fits all. There's no one model that fits all in a turnaround. We've got to react to the situation that we're in. Also, this approach is iterative. So you will complete it, then use it again and again in different functions of the business, marketing and sales, um, operations, etc. So going to the first step, which is the, the diagnostic. To me, this is the most important step in the, in the turnaround to really understand the problems. And unfortunately, we don't always do that. We tend, we will often go for the quick fix. Um, here's a problem, and there's a solution. Um, we should use the, the technique that our, that our children do, you know, when they frustratingly ask us sometimes, why daddy, why daddy? Until you reach a point where you're saying, well, because I said so. And it's the same with business. We go through those five whys, continually ask those questions. Why is this happening? So a simple example, we've got a cash flow problem. Why have we got a cash flow problem? Because our customers are not paying us on time. Why are they not paying us on time? They're not paying us on time because they're not happy with some quality issues. Why do we have quality issues? Because we've got people in operations who are not fully trained, etc., or we've got material issues with our supplier. So we continue to drill down until we get to the real problem. Once we find the real problem, we can then resolve it and we've got a better chance of making a successful turnaround. The next stage is that planning and create a window of time. We create the window of time simply to give us the breathing space to, to plan uh, the, the business. Um, creating the window of time involves talking to creditors, talking to banks, other lenders, talking to customers, talking to suppliers to give ourselves breathing space and um, to take off the pressure. It will involve some, some short term measures to actually reduce expenditure, for example, cutting out overtime, things like that. 
So it gives us breathing space to plan. The plan is key. This is not a business plan. This is not a 50 page document that we stick in the bottom drawer and forget about. This is a plan that's in the hearts and minds of management and all the staff and all the people in the business. It's a living thing and it will change and evolve as a turnaround moves forward. But it is key and it is important that time is spent on this planning process. The next stages are implementation and, and, and management. To implement, we need to empower people. This is about step change. Continuous improvement does not work in, um, in a turnaround situation. We're talking about radical change. We're talking about thinking about the, the business model itself. You know, why are we in selling all these products? Are the products, which products are making money? Which customers uh, are the most profitable? You know, um, which market should we be in? Uh, what is our model? Look at our structure and, and make some changes. It is radical change. It is step change. Otherwise, we'll not will not be successful. Managing it will not be easy because we will have problems. The plan will not be will not be achieved fully. As things will fall short. That always happens. We've got to be prepared for that. The key thing is to understand that and be able to react to those situations as they evolve. So. In my view, turnaround always needs, in my own experience, this is three things, management, time, and money. And if I look at these individually, first of all, looking at uh, management and the need to change. Um, turnaround cannot be achieved without change. That is, goes without saying, it will not happen. We both need to think differently, but we also need to be different. And that means we've got to change the culture. Now, in my view, you can only change the culture from the top. You can't bring in an advisor to change the culture. You can't change it from the bottom. If you look at a family business, for example, in a family business, the culture of the business is that of the family. It is the, the, it is the family values, the family ethics, the family morals, etc. That's what drives a business. And so it is in any business. And the culture is driven from the top. So if you want to change the culture, we have got to start with the people at the top. Objectivity. People often say, you know, um, you've got to think outside the box. Well, you know, sometimes it's difficult to do that when you're actually sitting in the box and the lid is shut. Um, we all know, I'm sure, that some of our best thoughts about our businesses are when we're out walking the dog, um, sitting on the beach, um, or four o'clock in the morning when we wake up and, ah, oh, that's a great idea. Um, we've got to get outside the business. We've got to talk to other people. Um, there are business mentors, there's non-executive directors we're worth taking on. We can be a very objective because they're um, with the business, but they're not in the business. But there are also various business support networks, particularly right across Europe. In most regions, there are support networks which are there to signpost you to help and support. And of course, there are the likes of myself, business transformation and turnaround specialists um, who work in these areas. They're always there to you know, offer advice and to carry out an initial um, counselling session. And then you may have your own advisors, your accountants, lawyers. So it is important to talk to people, whether it's friends, family or professional advisors, talk to people and get other people's views. Taking advice, I believe some, management feel, some managers often feel that they should have all the answers. Uh, I'm the guy at the top, you know, I, I, if people look up to me, I've got to have all the answers, it's my job. If I'm going outside the business for advice, then that's a sign of weakness. Well, it is not. It's a sign of good, strong, robust management. That's using the resources that are available, whether they're in the company or outside the company. So taking advice is, is, is good, good management. But remember, you manage your advisors, they don't manage you. Top-down and bottom approach is, is one I use, which I think is, um, is key in a turnaround. It's about engaging with stuff, and it's about what I've referred to before about empowerment. Starting with leadership, you know, it is the role of senior management to lead. It is generals that win wars, and that's what we're there to do. Managers are there to lead, to inspire, and to direct, to develop the strategy. And when they're doing that, to consult with all employees. And by consultation, I don't mean simply communicating. I mean, more than that, I mean, counselling, asking views, getting views, gathering information. If you employ good people, you don't employ good people to tell them what to do. To, you employ good people to start telling you what to do. So we consult with people, we get their views, and then we empower them. 
we empower them, but we need to give them the skills. So looking at the other side from bottom up, then the people that are running this business, that are driving it, that are delivering, they're the ones with the skills and the knowledge. So if we empower them, they're then in a position to, to modify the strategy and to influence the leadership and the direction of the business. So by taking this top down, bottom up approach, we can come um, to uh, we can get into the right direction for the business. The overriding thing, the overriding most important factor in, uh, in, in this whole thing is about leadership, but also about three other things, three other key words, communication, communication, and communication is key in a, in a, in a successful turnaround. Money. Um, money, as I've said before, will not on its own solve the problems. Um, we can get money from within the business and from without. Typically, we can use things like invoice factoring, which can be difficult if you are distressed. Invoice factoring basically is um, borrowing against our, our debtor book and borrowing against our sales invoices. We can go to private equity firms, venture capitalists and other private investors, etc. Um, but again, we've got to have a convincing story to tell. We can take a more debt, well, debt's got to be serviced. Um, in some regions uh, throughout Europe, there are, there are grants uh, available, but sometimes it can be difficult if a company is troubled with cash flow. Um, and of course, we can go to our customers and um, ask them to, uh, for, for payments in advance, which sometimes might happen, often not. But you know, if we are creative, we can get money from within the business. Um, and to order to cash, cost cutting, pricing, and costing, etc. Um, but by being creative, we can think about different ways of doing that. And a couple of examples. One is a company in Wales I was involved with, uh, and a turnaround. They manufactured checkouts for supermarkets. The lead time was 12 weeks, and the last two weeks were in production. So production only had two weeks at the end. I'm always late always uh, last minute fixes on the checkouts before they went out. So it was always in a rush. So we carried out some process mapping, looked at where the delays were, the inefficiencies, which were in the drawing office, estimating, etc., And we cut back the lead time from 12 weeks to eight weeks. That meant that we invoiced one month early and the company had a significant injection of cash. Another example was again, um, engineering company, manufacturing company um, who, who bought steel. Um, they were always they were what you call a zombie company, um, making a bit of profit one month and lost the next month, but always struggling for cash and always going to the, the private equity owners asking for some more money, a bit like Oliver, uh, more please. Um, and the private equity firm didn't want to do that. I walked around the factory with the production director and said, how many of these products do you make every week? 47%, he said. Um, we make every week and we ship them within seven days. And the company had invoice discounting, so it could draw down on that. So I then said, well, we'll create a standard product line. We'll not move any machines. We'll create a standard product line. And I went to the steel manufacturers and said, can you give me 50,000 pounds of extra credit? And I'll give it you back within a week, within two weeks. And they agreed, reluctantly, they agreed. So with the 50,000 pounds, I bought 50,000 pounds of steel, and then produced it, and then because the market was 100%, shipped it at £100,000, um, paid the steel supplier £50,000 after I'd drawn it down from invoice discounting on the seventh day, and then put £50,000 into the bank to fund the working capital. That one thing alone helped to save that company. So what I'm saying is, let's be creative, because sometimes you don't need to go outside to get money. You can do it from internally. Time is, is, is key, um, and there are two elements to time. Um, There's a duration itself, and you can't do um, a turnaround in five minutes. Um, you can't do it in five months. The fastest I've done was uh, a web offset printing company. Um, it was in six months, we got it cash generative when I was with KPMG, um, but really it took another 18 months to actually say this company was, was secure. So it does take time, it can be 12 months, it can be 18 months, it could be two years, um, typically. And then there's the, 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 the time of management, the amount of time we put into this. If we don't put time into it, it will not happen. You know, senior management have got to devote most of their time to this, or if they haven't got the time, then they need to bring somebody in to actually do that. 
that could be something like a, the chief reconstruction officer, a uh, fancy title, um, or it could just be something to work alongside management. But the whole thing needs direction and it needs management time, um, otherwise it will, it will fail. Right, I'd like to go through um, some uh, two or three case studies quite quickly. Um, Romag Limited is one company I've just um, completed um, and have been sold successfully. The company um, it has been around a long time, since 1944, was employing 200 people, about 12 million turnover. Um, glass manufacturers, high technology glass. Um, over the years, it's had a number of different owners, different managing directors, different styles of management, some good, some not so good. Um, severe losses and loss of market, no leadership, staff a bit downhearted, didn't know where they were going, major quality issues, um, no sales team. Um, but the company had a fantastic technical reputation, which it still does. It's a, it's a well-known brand, uh, this the workforce, we are highly skilled and really good at what they, what they were doing. And that was the situation. What we did was, first of all, we had to reduce the, the workforce, that was inevitable which we did, so we got down to a good core effective team. Um, all employees were empowered and supported. That was done through intensive training, so every single person in the company had training um, and personal development plans. That made a massive difference. I also created a flatter organisation, took out some lines of management, so communication was better and direction was better. I then, I then created a hit squad to actually get into the factory and through all the operations and through all the offices because quality affects every process and we aggressively attacked quality issues um, which came down from 14% to 3% within three months. Um, I reorganized the sales team, built an internal sales team and then recru recruited a, a field sales team as well. Um, and then another key thing was to rationalize the product range. We do too many different things and I got that down from five down to two. So the company now focused on um, rail and security and defence and then we put in the, uh, the marketing resource to actually secure the contracts. One example, another one is Meshid um, Ranya Kiniga um, with offices based in Moscow of course, um, Minneapolis uh, and London. Um, the companies suffer from loss of sales, there's no distribution channels, uh, lack of leadership for cash flow and the political changes in Eastern Europe which affected the company um, badly. Um, what we did there was solution there was to change the business model. So, for example, I closed down three shops in London, closed down another a number of other shops in um, in Warsaw and Budapest and Köln, Cologne, etc. Um, and then put um, these book selling into concessions into other booksellers, and then focused really on um, building relationships and contracts with universities, which is where the company focused. And that in itself um, turned the company around until we sold it. Um, last example is another well-known brand, Silver Cross Pram has been around <clears throat> since 1870. There have been a gradual decline in sales over a number of years because products were out of date, they hadn't kept up with modern trends, there was no real leadership, no direction, procedures and manufacturing was inefficient and the sales and marketing was not really working, leading to poor cash flow. Um, Action here was then to build a sales and marketing team, which I approached from uh, competitors. Um, we outsourced 50% of the manufacturing <clears throat> locally, um, reduced the site down, so I could then finance the turnaround, built a new management team, and then I was able to go to market and get some new cash into the business. And ultimately, again, the company, we sold the company successfully. So that is me, I'll now I hand you back to, um, to Sophia, but I'm delighted to talk to anybody, you know, outside of this meeting on a one-to-one -one consultation. Uh, all you have to do is give me a call or speak to Sophia or Lilia. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry, for that uh, insightful presentation. I think it was valuable for all of us. We have just a couple of minutes left. So if you, the audience, have any questions at all, please send them to us now. Um, but just before we jump into the Q&A, I'd like to say that if you have um, any questions after the webinar, feel free to reach out to us at info at nmsconsulting.com. And if you want to read up on us a little bit more, you can always visit our website, www.nmsconsulting.com. So let me see if we have any questions yet. No. Okay. In that case, I actually have my own questions prepared, Harry, if you don't mind. 
Yeah, okay. Right, okay. No, no, that. Yeah. All right, here we go. So how do you take a people on a journey of restructuring and change? How does it start? What's the process? I think I've referred to some of it through the presentation, empowerment, and I did say those three ways, communication, 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 communication is really key. It's involvement, it's participation, it's getting people involved, and remember that they are also as stakeholders, as employers, employees, sorry. Um, so involvement, get them involved, consult with them, um, and give them the, the support they need, but really communicate with them all the way down the line so they understand what you're doing, we're doing, and why we're doing it. I think mean, there's a question popped to buzzer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, what best actions would you recommend for cost cutting procurement actions during turnaround activities? This comes from Juan. So this is cost cutting. Yeah, well, the, the, the obvious things, I mean, t taking people out is usually the first thing that people look at, but that can, in itself can be expensive. And there's a danger of actually reducing people too much because sometimes you take out good people, then that disables you from actually growing the business. So you'd be, be wary of that. Um, it, it's looking at things, of, it's doing things differently, saying we don't, you know, it's stopping doing things. So outsourcing things, um, you know, um, you close down functions, you get somebody else to do it. So transport, for example, you might want to outsource. Your maintenance, you might want to outsource. It's doing things like that. In terms of procurement, I think it's then going back to your um, uh, your suppliers and negotiating better terms or looking at what you're buying and do you need, do you need, you know, looking at your, your design, looking at your, um, it's called value engineering, look at, looking at, you know, do you need, can you buy cheaper materials, for example, if you're in manufacturing? Um, but, you know, I find that if you go to, um, um, to, 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 to suppliers, quite often, if you're in a situation, they will discuss terms with you and there's a possibility of reducing, reducing prices, even if it's on a temporary basis. Great, thank you. Um, there's also a second question from the audience. Do you recommend outsourcing to re to reduce budget loads? It's kind of related. Yeah, uh, outsourcing sometimes it can be can be more expensive if you're not careful. But in my experience, it's not just the the cost; it's also the, the management of of that function. And I think if you can consolidate as much as possible into your core business, look at the things that you're, you're good at, uh, you know, and if, 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 if you're not good at maintenance, um, you know, why bother doing it to get somebody else to do it? So if there are functions that you can take outside, um, th then do that. Just look at what is my core business? What, what are my strengths? What, what, am I, what am I really providing my customers with here? And focus on that. Am I, or am I doing some ancillary things, which are nice, nice to have inside um, and easy um, because they're local. But, you know, can somebody else do it better, more cheaply and more efficiently than me? Okay. Um, so we're just one minute over time, but I have one burning question that I'd like to ask you before we just sign off, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. All so right. Given the current situation with COVID-19 and the resulting economic situation, um, do you think <clears throat> it's still possible in your eyes to raise finance for companies in difficulty? Yes, it is. I mean, recently with, with, with the company I just mentioned, um, I've been talking to a number of private equity firms um, and there is a lot of um, activity uh, going on. I believe that private equity firms particularly are being very selective because there is a lot out there being selective on what, um, on what they look at. But certainly there is, in my experience, personal experience, there is money out there for the right business. The, the important thing is, you know, when we present to a private equity firm or any investor, um, quite frankly, we've got to have a, have a plan. There's got to be something in it for them. There's got to be a return. We've got to have a robust plan that is achievable, not the hockey stick, not that we've been grumbling for a number of years and we're suddenly going to be making, uh, doing, doing, doing very, very well in the future. It's going to be a realistic, achievable plan. And also remember that what private equity investors invest in is management rather than businesses. It is management the key to any investment. You've got to have the right management team. Great, thank you. So we have one last question from the audience. I think we should take it and then yeah. let everybody get on their way. So we have, how can you negotiate with suppliers when sales are going down during turnaround activities? 
I'll get, yeah, that, uh, a very, a very, yeah, a very good, yeah, because it, if, if they know that, if they know that your your sales are going down, um, they might be concerned. Um, you can negotiate how, how you do it. I mean, you 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 you, you talk about um, you 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 share with them your plans. I mean, you've got to be transparent. You've got to be realistic. Uh, you've got to be honest with them. Um, and if you can go to, um, as I've done, go to a supplier, say, look, you know, they know you're suffering from sales because they see that the, the demand you're placing on them has gone down. What are your plans for the future? So I think it's going out to them and sharing with them. So this is this is my business plan. This is what I'm doing. This is how we're going about it. Um, uh, and we're looking for your support. We've got to remember that, you know, it's a partnership. The, when we think about the supply chain, it starts with our suppliers, um, ourselves, and our customers. We're all working together, and we've got to think about that as a partnership. So I think transparency and honesty, and going to suppliers and say, we've got some difficulty at the moment, I'll share that with you, but hey, this is what we're doing about it, and this is why we believe it will succeed. And can you support us? I think you might find that most suppliers, in my experience, will, 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 will respect that. Perfect. All right, thank you so much. Then um, I just want to thank everybody again who joined today. Uh, I mentioned earlier at the very beginning of the webinar that we will be hosting another at the end of November. So be sure to keep your eye out for that. Otherwise, have a lovely rest of your day and until the next time then. Okay, thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.